Hey, Tim, I'm really good. Can you hear me? Yep, I gotcha. How are right. you doing? Dude, good, man. It's such an honor to talk to you. Oh, man, great to talk to you, too. Thanks for calling. No problem. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I'm super excited. You know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Great. Um, awesome. And um, I, 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 especially with the new album and, and knowing your thoughts on it. Um, great. It should be fun. Um, I would like to start the the interview with. Um, I I did a lot of research on you know other interviews you've done, and um, and I sort of one of the things that really stood out to me <clears throat> is your passion behind uh, your track American Attraction. Mm, and, yeah, uh, you said a quote in there that uh, in, in a in a previous interview about. Um, you know how there's so much attra- a distraction in, in the real problems in the world. Um, yeah, you know Trump firing people, uh, his uh, homophobic and and uh, um, you know his rants on his tweet Twitter. Um, right. Yeah, sort of the, the politics of distraction. Yeah. In in in. In the meantime, there you know he's green lighting oil, you know natural gas, coal, uh, weapon manufacturers are right. the highest, um, and rolling back already, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, rolling back uh, environmental uh, policies that are already yeah, put. Right. Um. The the one thing that really gets me with that is i mean that's 100 percent true in, in us as you know um as americans it seems like we rather get mad at a homophobic tweet or him firing somebody in his cabinet than the real problems that affect our world um when, yeah. you're, when you're writing that song like what was the the major influence besides those like what was the major mm-hmm message you wanted to get out well you know the, i think all of them all of these issues matter right yes. so it's not it's not that the homophobic stuff or the racist stuff doesn't matter because it does but it's the idea that we are trying to say to people hey there are other things too i understand why the sexist racist islamophobic bigoted xenophobic <laughs> nationalists. I understand why those things resonate with people in such a hard way because they're so personal. You know, and for me, for example, there are African Americans in my family. You know, I have a lot of gay friends. I have trans friends. I clearly there are women in my family. Um the uh you know, our, our guitar player is, is marrying a woman from a Muslim family. Like, when I talk to these people and they say to me, you know, as a result of Donald Trump, I feel unsafe. You know, I feel uncomfortable in my own skin. Uh, one of my friends, and I used this line in, in the song Casualty on the record, he said to me, you know, when he's Muslim, and he said, because of my last name, I feel feel scared now when I have to deal with law enforcement or when I fly. So, and I think that those people have a right to be scared. I, I, they should be scared. I mean, you look at Charlottesville, for example, and you realize, like, okay, you know, their fears are justified. Um, so, uh, it, it, I think all of us are in touch with somebody from one of these groups that Trump persecutes and we understand these people on a human level. So when he goes to those, when he scapegoats and persecutes those people, I think it's natural for people to most gravitate their, their um, disgust with Donald Trump in those areas. Um, what, what blew my mind and the reason that we were, in, that we were influenced to write American Attraction was because we realized that in just a, a number of months, Donald Trump has rolled back 30 years of environmental regulations in the U.S. And, you know, our planet is 
racing towards uh, a climate disaster. We don't have time to be rolling back environmental regulations that are going to make our oceans more acidic, that are going to um, warm our planet in a way that it's not going to be hospitable for human life anymore. And um, at the same time, as he's, he's doing that, um, you know, you, you just look at who are, the, who are the biggest winners as a result of Donald Trump becoming president. And, you know, the, the first, one of the very first things he did when he became president is he went to Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, the, one of the biggest oil-producing nations in the world, and he uh, did a $110 billion arms deal. And, you know, anti fight started as an anti-war ban, you know, like, so <laughs> I, all of, all of these issues, um, really struck a chord with me. And I, and I realized, like, it is important to care about the, the human issues that, that touches on a personal level, but it's, we, we have to realize there's other issues that are taking place and it's important for us to be aware of those. In, in the way that our country, you know, you know, the United States, is, some can, some would say, you know, we're the leader of the free world. And it, it seems that we are going in the direction of, you know, what money is more important than human life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, told, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, American Attraction is about that. On, in, a, in a really big way because and, and, and another you know in the same way the song The Criminals which is track two on the record that's very much what the song is about you know when when the president gives a speech it's amazing how often he gives that aside where he says things like I'm really successful I've made a lot of money and basically what he's doing when he says that is he's saying that one of you know, the, the, one of the most important things that matters in our society is the amount of wealth that you have. And that's something that people should be admired for. And that's something that we should hold up as a value. And it's my belief that when you start to hold up wealth as a value over people, that's when you get Charlottesville. That's when you get the shooting in Las Vegas you know, that horrible, tragic shooting that we had in Las Vegas. That's when you get this terrible shooting that we had in the church in Texas. Because what's happening is, as a society, we're not valuing our human relationships. We're not valuing uh, coming together as community and taking care of one another and, and supporting one another. Instead, we're, we're making it a... Comp we're making... Society a competition. We're making our value competition, and the reality is that at the end of a competition, there's a loser. Somebody's lost, and that means that there are people who are not connected to other people. They feel isolated. They feel alone. They feel left behind. They feel angry, and that results in tragedy. Um, so, you know, American Attraction is a song. Well, it's about distraction politics. It's also about um, what do we value in a society? You know, right now I feel like we value who's the wealthiest, who's got the most brute force, whether it comes through guns or whether it comes through violence of some other nature, you know. Um, so, and the song The Criminals is, is about a, 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 in a, it's told in a different way, but it's, it, it, again, it's asking that question, um, you know, what do we want our society to look like? And right now what our society looks like is not leading to uh, the, the outcome that we're looking for, but I also believe that there is a possibility for change and that, you know, that change, of course, starts one person at a time. And so... It's up to people to ask themselves, like, okay, what do, what do I want our society to value? And then it's up to each individual then to go out and start putting a value on those things versus, you know, 
who who's got the most profit. <clears throat> On a strictly strategic level, what do you think we can do? Uh, what do you think it would take for for human beings to start valuing human human beings again? I mean, will it take something well, like a yeah. mass mass death? Um, you know, because the way I look at it is. No matter where you look, you know, you have social media, you look on social media, like everybody, um, for the most part, you know, the people who aren't really, um, their eyes aren't really open to uh, the, the bigger problems of the earth. Um, yeah, for sure. Agree. It, w- what can we do? Because I'm well, uh, I've done a lot, you know, I'm, and I'm really at a, at a change in my life where I'm thinking like, you know what? I'm ready to, to do like, I'm willing to give. I'm ready to give up my job at this point to be a teacher Mm -hmm. because that's my only, I don't see how else I can help. You know, I'm very active in my community. I, I, I preach, um, love. I preach respect, Mm -hmm. um, with that and not in a, a a religious way, but as a human respect way. And yeah. the only thing I can think of is, you know, there's a lot of younger parents these days. Uh, with being younger parents, you have uh, less developed thoughts. Therefore, sure. you encourage your, your children to do things that are outside their age bracket. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then they take that into the world, which then just dominoes. Right, right. And so the teacher well, is where I think that we can start instilling more value, you know, more, um, uh, you know, it, more of the, the value of, of human life and, and how to treat each other and um, even learning. Um, yeah. You've been fighting well, this I, I for really, a while. So I was, that's why I was yeah, wondering I, what you think. I applaud that. I mean, I really applaud that. I mean, that's really amazing of you. And I, I think really what you're doing is exactly what needs to happen. I mean, I think a first step is for people to take a step back from the, the life that they're living right now and really ask themselves, like, are, am I happy living in, in this society as it is right now? I think that's the first step, you know, because um, a lot of people would answer that no. You know, a lot of people would answer that question like, man, I'm just running my ass off. I'm treading water. I'm just keeping ahead of the sheriff. I'm just, you know, I'm just out of the red or I'm in the red and it's not working. You know, and I'm dulling my yeah. my feelings with alcohol and drugs and I'm on antidepressants and this fucking sucks, you know. So, it, and I do this check with myself a lot, believe it or not, because I, I know that there's so much power in our society just from all the messages we receive every day, everything that we're around, everything that we see on TV. You know, it, it's, it, it's, always, it's always geared towards get the new thing, get the shinier thing, get more, get more, get more, you know? Consume, consume, and, consume. Yeah. And as soon as I fall into that trap, I get anxious. I start to <laughs> not be, not, not feel good, you know? And it's, um, I don't think anybody, I mean, I actually have friends that are really immune to it and I find it fascinating. I think it's great, you know, but, <laughs> but I think it's a hard thing to be immune to. Um, so I think it's important for people to look at their lives and then say, well, if I'm not, happy because I'm, I keep just trying to get this stuff. What, what's the alternative? You know, I see a lot of people, I think taking those steps, so a lot of people simplifying their lives. Like you, there's, there's this movement now where, um, uh, of people who are minimalist, you know, and I, and I, I look at those people and I, I hear a lot of them being really happy. And I, so I think that, we actually, there, there's a there's a movement within our culture in a way that there's never been in my lifetime that I've noticed in that direction. And it's, it's anybody from like 30 years, maybe mid-30s down, you know? And I see it a lot stronger in people like in their 20s. Um, 
And so I, I actually am pretty optimistic, believe it or not. Like, I, I think that there's, there's all, we're already seeing a, a huge backlash against Trump because we, and the, and the values that he stands for. Um, when we, we were on tour in January of 2017, and there were so many people that came up to me saying things like, I was sleepwalking, I wasn't paying attention, I was apathetic, I didn't care, um, but now I do. And, you know, I think Donald Trump was a big wake-up call for a lot of people, and I, and I think that we're seeing a lot of debates take place as a result of his presidency that needed to take place. Deba- debates about sexual harassment, sexism, racism, um, and, you know, things that we've never really talked openly and honestly on a, in a large way in our society. They're, they're things that have been kind of swept under the rug in a lot of ways, things that we just haven't faced or things that people have denied exist. Those things were around before Donald Trump. He's helped bring them to the surface. I mean, Donald Trump is not the disease. Donald Trump is a symptom. Mm-hmm. So... So, so to answer your question, I mean, it, it's it, it's not what's going to happen as, like, there's going to be a leader and they're going to take us all to promise and, and things are going to be better. But unfortunately, it's it's harder than that. And the work is harder. And it, it comes down to how, how you approach things on a personal level. And that's why I believe what you are talking about and what you're doing I think is really admirable and I, and I think it's spot on because it's, you know, you're, you made a decision to rework your life to have an impact on other people's lives. And, and that's really what it's going to take. I don't think it's reasonable to think that every single person can know about every single injustice in the world and everything that's wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Um, it's impossible, but I but I do think that when we look around our communities and we, we and, and sometimes beyond, you know, um, we we can have an impact on the planet, and it, it just happens one person at, at a time, you know. And I and and I, I mean I've been involved and been around activism, I should say, more so than been involved in it, but I've been around it long enough to see that. Change isn't something that just comes overnight. You know, you identify a problem and then boom, it's gone. It's it's quite often a struggle and it's it's a it's a war. And in that war, there's a lot of battles, and a lot of those battles are lost. But over time, it went, if, if if you stick to it, a lot, you know, battles can be won. And um, and I think that's kind of where we're at right now. You know, my hope for people is that they will at least just pay attention enough that we don't repeat this kind of Donald Trump uh, presidency again, you know? Mm -hmm. But let's be honest about it. You know, there are problems with Bush and there are problems with Obama. And, you know, uh, those, you know, Trump, again, is just a symptom of things that, of problems that we already had in our society. I don't know if that gives you much of an answer, you know. It's yeah, it sort definitely of... does. Definitely does. And, okay. and um, okay. I like that. <clears throat> um, cool. Moving forward, um, for many years now, um, it seems that there's been a, a corporate takeover in America. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and my question to you is, um, it's a two-parter. Sure. Um, Hillary... If she had been elected, would it be any different? And mm-hmm. the second part to that is, do you think, just maybe, that uh, by electing Donald Trump, it's pushing us in the right direction faster? Well, as far as the corporate takeover goes, it, it's real. I mean, if you go to any strip mall in America, they all look the same. And they're all owned by the same people, you know? I mean, 
that's the one thing that always blows my mind. I and mean, we travel all over the country and every city just looks the same. It's the same shop in every city. And that means that the, the profits in every local community are all leaving that community and all going to a very small group of people who own everything. So the corporate takeover is real, you know, and that's just one small example of it. Um, the corporate takeover under Hillary wouldn't be any different than the corporate takeover Trump with Trump. I mean, I think that, you know, Trump is not, it's interesting because a lot of people see Donald Trump as this kind of anti-establishment person because he didn't approach politics in the traditional way that it's been approached by the mainstream parties over the last, you know, half century. But Donald Trump is as mainstream and as status quo as there is. I mean, he, he might as well be living on Wall Street. You know, that, those are his friends. That, those are his people. You know, corporate America is Donald Trump. So people would think he's some kind of anti-establishment person. He's a billionaire. I mean, they really need to rethink that uh, that analysis. <laughs> um, my issue with uh, what I do understand is on a personal level, just from witnessing it, um, I, I realize that there are people under Donald Trump who are being sacrificed and hurt right now that I, that I, tr I truly don't believe would have been hurt under Hillary Clinton in the same way. And I, you know, I was not, I'm not a fan of Hillary Clinton in any way. But, you know, I don't believe that under Hillary Clinton, ICE agents would be breaking into the homes of undocumented residents of the United States and literally tearing families apart. Um, you know, I, I don't think the persecution that's happening right now from Muslims would, would be happening. I think that African Americans would have a fighting chance at, uh, at, at having their grievances of having two African Americans every day being killed by police. They would at least have a, a foothold where they could start from. With Donald Trump, it's actually going backwards. There, there's, there, it, there's not even a foothold. There is no steps, you know. Um, so this idea that we need like this shock therapy to make things rush forward better, that's a really hard one for me to, to get behind because I see and I know some of the people that are being affected by what's happening with Donald Trump. You know, like it, the trans community, like there are people that, you know, that are documented who just felt so hopeless under Donald Trump, like, People killed themselves. I mean, it's that's a real thing, and those are real lives. So, I believe that we could have made progress without having to do it this way. I've seen progress made over just the lifetime of this ban. Um, you know, with thirty years of environmental regulation being rolled back in just a number of months with Scott Pruitt. I don't think that would have happened under Hillary Clinton. So, you know, it, it's really, it, that's a really, really hard question for me to, to answer. And I, I can't honestly say that I know, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, all I know is a lot of people have been hurt. A lot of progress has been lost. And I know that this is where we are. This is the hand we have been dealt. And this is what we have to address now. So, you know, whether Hillary would have been better or not, I guess at this point it's kind of a, it's kind of a moot point. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it comes down to the fact that this is where we are, so it, it's time for us to, to, get, to get on our feet and, and start pushing back. Um, and just one more question, uh, Based sure. off of off of this topic that I had, um, going back to 
uh, you know, the corporate takeover. And mm-hmm. do you do you feel that? And listen, I'm I'm just trying to, uh, you know, I'm just bringing up the topic for thought. You know, sure. Um, sure. Do you think that we are turning into as Americans as corporate slaves? Um, not just us uh, as you know the communities uh, in America, but um, the political leaders as well. Mm. Well, I think the political leaders have been have been corporate slaves for a long time. I mean, to use that term, I mean, their their campaigns and their positions of power have been bought by corporations a long time ago. Um, so. So for the most part, I, I think that's true. There are some some politicians out there that I think have been able to tread around that, um, and some of them have navigated it better, and some of them were. You know, it's like some of them are just totally sold out, I and mean, then some of them are just a little sold out. You know, and I mean, uh, and, and I'll take better over worse any day. Um, so. Uh, but, but certainly, I mean, there, you know, Ralph Nader talked about this all the way back in the, the early 90s. I mean, this is why Ralph Nader won, you know, or why, why, why Ralph Nader ran as a candidate, because he said that he used to be able to go into the offices of, of politicians on Capitol Hill and bring to them an, a, an issue that affected consumers and affected citizens of the United States and things that were dangerous, and they would actually at least hear them out, and sometimes they would make a positive change. And he said what happened was it just came a day when nobody would even talk to him anymore. And he realized that these politicians are totally bought. And that's why he ran uh, on the, as a Green. you know. And, and some people say that as a result of him running as a Green, George Bush won the won the election and beat Al Gore, you know, my assessment of it isn't that Ralph Nader uh, was the deciding factor. My take on it was that Al Gore was the deciding factor. <laughs> Al Gore just didn't didn't offer much of an alternative to the American people, so he didn't vote for him. And again, that just comes back to the idea that Al Gore just came pretty bought to me. So, wh- when it comes down to, like, on an individual level, well, I guess if we're living in a corporate state, which we pretty much are at this point, I guess to a certain degree, you know, we're all controlled by that corporate state. It's, it's, uh, and, I, and I think it takes, it takes energy and effort to, to work around it and, and to um, live outside of it. And, and you know, it's just, it's a personal choice as to how, if you want to do that and, and how you're going to do that. You know, I mean, good luck trying to find a pair of shoes that, that weren't made in China, you know, yeah. or, you know, or, you know, or a smartphone that, that, that wasn't made with minerals that are, that are possibly conflict minerals, mm-hmm. you know? So, so we're all, we're all, if we're, we're living in this, this country and in this society and you know, I've chosen to live here this is where I'm going to be we're, we're all caught up in it to a certain degree you know and it's, it's I, that's why I think there, there are certain things where we can do where we can spend our money certain ways we can put certain things in our body you know I, I like the idea of for me personally like being a vegetarian because I think that it's a way that I personally can have an effect on someone or something else's life and make an impact on that, that thing's life. And maybe, um, you know, that's, that's where I can bring something positive into the world. And I, I really am a big believer in, you know, because obviously that there's a lot of negativity out there. There's all these problems, right? And it, they seem so big. And I'm like, well, look, I mean, if you've ever suffered in life at all, and someone came along and they helped you and they took that suffering away from you, that's really valuable. You understand how special that is and, and how meaningful that is. So and every day I just try to think to myself, I'm like, well, how can I reduce 
someone else is suffering in just one action that I'm taking. And, and it might seem like a really small thing, but if it's re- reducing someone's suffering in any way, whether that's a person or an animal or whatever it is, you know, whoever it is, I, that's actually really valuable, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I guess, you know, I've gone on a tangent, but I will mm-hmm. say, like, that's, that's why I really respect Amnesty International and what they do, because they work to free political prisoners and people who are, who are being held unjustly, sometimes in really horrible, torturous conditions because of their political uh, speech or their political thought. And the way they do it is they have these little writing campaigns and, and they amass so much pressure of these uh, letter writing campaigns that they're able to free people from governments that are oppressive. And, you know, you might think to yourself, you're like, oh, I'm only one person, I can't do that much. Um, but, you know, if you were sitting in a cell and every letter that was written had, had the possibility of, of being part of your release from that cell, suddenly every one of those letters is really critical and really special to you. So I always just try to take that view on the world because I understand that a lot of the problems are bigger than, than just one than just me, and I can't solve them alone, but I still really believe that even if we can't solve every world problem, we can still make the world better for some people, and, and you know, that's, to me, that's really valuable, because if you're the person suffering, then uh, it, it's really, really special to you. Yeah. <clears throat> when all is said and done, and, and the book uh, of Justin saying is closed, <laughs> what do you want the world to remember you by? And what do you? Well, what would you have liked to have done? What would you have liked to have yeah, meant to the earth? Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's a couple of things there. I mean, I I think that I've always looked at every every record that Anti Flags made as sort of a place where I plant my flag in the sands of history to try to say back to people who look back on our history, if they're trying to understand who I was or what was going on at that time, that they could look at it and get a sense of who I was, you know? And, uh, like, for example, I think that the Gulf War will be looked upon uh, in history very poorly, and I would like people who are trying to understand it to say, well, like, why didn't people resist it? And then be able to find, like, okay, there were people that resisted Um I think with Donald Trump, it's the same thing. You know, it's, you know, right now, I don't think you can stand on the sidelines. It's important to to plant your your flag in the sand and, and pick a side. Um, more than anything, though, what is important to me, and I think what attracted to me, uh, what attracted me to punk rock more than anything, is is empathy. You know, trying to. Having just a, somehow the ability to try to put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand the struggles that other people are going through. And maybe because I've gone through certain struggles in my life, I have, and I think everybody has, but my particular struggles for whatever reason have um, made me have, a, for some reason, just be able to feel empathy for others who are suffering. And I, I, at least that's how I look at myself and that's how I would like people to, to remember me because I think once we can start to empathize with the struggles that others are going through and we can put ourselves in their shoes, um, you know, I think that that's the first step towards caring and, and maybe affecting change for, for somebody else who's suffering. And um, my next question is, you know, I'm sw- switching gears again. Uh, are you? Do you watch Stranger Things? Oh yeah, yeah, I do. I love it. <laughs> I know it's such a great show. Um, yeah. Did you hear Ill Repute? Ill Repute in the the second season? Oh, I guess I did. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. I didn't realize it. But now that you bring it up, yeah. Yeah, well, ill repute. They're from my hometown, where, where we're based out of Ventura, Oxnard. They're from Oxnard, and uh, awesome. and Tony Cortez. He, you know, he told us that. Oh yeah, check it out. And man, it was such an awesome the way that they 
you know, captivate the 80s in every sense. Yeah. It's yeah. just the greatest right. thing in the world. And, you know, uh, when we heard that you were gonna, we were going to do the interview with you, I was like, oh, this guy's got it. For one, he's got to love Stranger Things. I, it just for some reason, right. my heart, right. I knew it. Um, and it, it was just, it's just an awesome show, and I thought I'd bring it up to you. I do, I do love it, and I, I can't even begin to tell you, because I was literally those kids age in that show at that time and it blows my mind how perfectly we recreate that time like honestly like it puts me right back there it's crazy you know <laughs> and the good the good and the bad you know and, and i look back and i remember I, I see the absurdity in it you know i mean the 80s was such a weird absurd time i mean it was such a time of transition culturally you know and it was like you know there was all this it, people were so excited about you know technology in the future and computers you know <laughs> <laughs> and, and and uh and to look back on it now it just it, it feels so childish you know and even like um even with the um, just sort of socially, you know, the way people kind of treat each other, it looks archaic in some ways, you know. Yes. And and uh, and it was. I mean, I think back on it, I'm like, fuck, it really was. And, and, like, know, and what drives me crazy about the '80s is like everybody thought it was okay to make fun of Asian people. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> like in yeah. any movie, like that was the cool thing. Like, oh, it's not racist. It's just yeah. funny. You know? No. <laughs> Right, six, 16 Candles, you know, yes. Long Duck Song. You know, like, yeah, like, it, it, it was like, <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's where I feel like we've made some progress. You know, like, you can, you can look back and feel like, like you, could, you can be in the world today and just be like, oh, we haven't gotten anywhere and things are fucked. But, you know, when I was growing up, if you were in my neighborhood, and you were a black kid, you probably would have gotten beat up, you know? And now in that same neighborhood, like I walked into a coffee shop the other day, and there's all kinds of people in there, and there was this white guy tutoring this black kid, and I thought to myself, man, this is so awesome, because we actually have come a long way, you know? And, and things have changed, and it's... Um, it's we, we definitely have our problems, you know, um, and we're, we're not there yet, but um, it, it is exciting at, at times when I, I see those things and I experience those things and have those moments. So I'm like, all right, I know there's a lot of problems. I know we have a long way to go, <laughs> but um, coming from where I came, like, I mean, and, and racism was just, like, accepted, mm -hmm. but homophobia was just, like, off the charts. I mean... Yeah. You know, it, one, of, one of the most heartening things that happened to us this summer was that, you know, we played World Tour for the first time since 2008, so it was a long time, or 2010, I don't know, it's like, it's been a long time since we played it, and then every day on World Tour we do a signing, and you know, we just hang out at our tent at a certain time, anybody can come by if they want to, and you know, take a picture, or just say hi, or whatever, and, um... That's usually, like, to me, the best part of the day. Because you get to meet people and find out, like, what's going on with their lives and what they're into. And, you know, it's just exciting because we'll tour the long day and it's a grind. And it's it's a refreshing part of the day. And um, what was really cool about this work tour that never happened before to us on work tours, every day there was a couple of trans kids that came to our tent. And... Why that was so refreshing and so cool to me is that I know all those other years that we did work tour, those trans kids were out there, but they were not openly out there. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't be. And what's amazing is that we're making progress in certain areas where, you know, it's like, okay, you know, it, it might not be every day, but for this day, these kids can actually be who they are they know that they have allies out there. They know they can come up to our tent and talk to us just 
about the fucking weather or their favorite band or whatever, and that they know that they have somebody who's their ally. And, you know, that that's really, like, to me, that was the most inspiring thing about uh, about the summer. And um, so there's, as much as it feels like we're, we're stepping backwards, and we are right now, um, we've made a lot of progress, you know, and it's, it's often, like, three steps forward, two steps back. That's sort of how, how history goes a lot of the time. So we're, we're in that two step back period, but it, it doesn't mean that we won't move forward again. And I have one last question for you. <clears throat> what do you think makes punk rock so special? And the reason why I say this is because, you know, I was in the military, I got out, and I sort of like, all right, what can I do? You know, I, I wanted to be yeah. like a WWF superstar. Like that was my thing. So <laughs> cool. uh, I ended up having a kid and, that, and it was just off the table, you know. And then I was yeah. like, listen, I want to get into radio. So I start radio yeah. and, you know, uh, then we start the magazine. And But I remember at the very beginning that we had, you know, the rock guys were dicks. The metal guys were dicks. Like, our radio station, we do it all from country to hip-hop and everything in between. Okay. But the one community that was just like, come here, and, and they treated us like gold. And and it wasn't just me, because of who I was. I noticed over time, it was just because this is who they are. These The punk rock yeah. community loves... And they're not afraid to love. They're not afraid to cry. They're not afraid to hug you. Yeah. They're not exp- afraid to um, in- invite in the outcasts. And right. not only that, but you know when they when they are I- inviting us in, like you see how they treat everybody and how they how the mm-hmm. community is so strong. Um, yet society shuns them because they're different. What do you mm-hmm. think? is the main reason why the, not just in my city, but you know, I was in um, South America when I was traveling in the military and the punk rock scene out there is just as awesome. And they're like, come here, let's go, let's go eat. Like, and they just barely met me, you know, 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. What do you think it is? I mean, you've had, you know, was going on 30 years, you know, uh, or, or almost, what do you think it is? Well, there's two things I'll say, if you don't mind. The first thing about you being in the military, it, it doesn't surprise me that you were in the military, um, especially, like, hearing how altruistic you are and with the way that you've been thinking about your life and what you want to do and how you want to help people because I often find that, like, some of the most altruistic people that I meet, especially in the punk scene, are people who have been in the military. And, um, and you know, my my aversion to the military has always been what presidents and politicians do with people like you Mm. because you sign up because you believe in doing good and then they take you and they use you to fight for oil and i and then you come back and you're like that was fucked that's not what i went for and i you know and that's my aversion to encouraging people to join the military Mm -hmm. but i just wanted i just wanted to say that because I think it's really amazing to talk to you, like the whole time to find you. You're so altruistic and you're so passionate, and like you wanted, you want to do good. And I, and and so I just, when you told me in the military, I was like, oh, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> you know, that makes sense. <laughs> um, but also, um, I, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, there with, with with the punk community and and the openness. Of it, ultimately, you know, I think that it's it, it, it's a result of people who felt on the outside and people who were attracted to punk rock because they were misfits in one way or another, you know. And maybe they were just misfits in the idea that they just gave a fuck about more than just themselves. And as a result of that, you know, they they find a band like minor threat or they find a band like Propagandi or Bad Religion or Rise Against, right? And 
these are brands that are talking about giving a fuck a lot more than yourself and actually like being open to other people and, and standing in solidarity and with people who are being persecuted, with people who don't have a voice, uh, people who can't fight for themselves. And, and for me, like that's the number one message I want people to take away from American fall. It's to me, it's a record of solidarity. It's a, the record. It's about, giving a voice to people who don't have a voice, and it's about letting people who are being scapegoated and persecuted know that we're here and we're not going away. Like, we're, we're going to fight for you in, in, to our dying breath. Like, and if, if you're being one of the people who's being victimized by Donald Trump, don't worry, we got your back. And, and I think as a result of that, there is this unwritten role in punk rock where if you find somebody who's in the punk, you realize that right away that you guys have a, a, a commonality and a certain um, a certain set of morals that you both believe in. And and sometimes those morals are just fuck authority, man. Like fuck it, <laughs> you know. Like yeah. for some people, that's all it is. But you still connect on that, and you still re- relate on that, you know. And I I meet a lot of people in punk who have zero interest in the political side of anti-black, but they love that we give the middle finger to the man, you know, and yeah. because that because they have been, they feel like they've been uh, persecuted personally by the man their whole lives. Like they, you know, they were in high school and they got fucking treated like shit by the teachers because the teachers didn't get them, you know. So they they have this anti this anti authority streak, and so I just believe that in punk rock, there people understand. It's like man, you see that that back patch of, uh, you know, that, that bad religion back patch on or, or the exploited or whatever it is. And you're like, okay, like we, I know that this person and I, we've got something that matters to both of us. And for a lot of people, like, and I think that I'm one of those people, I think that punk rock really saved my life, you know, to a certain degree. So it's like, I, if somebody saves your life, you respect that person, right? Like you honor that person. And so when I see somebody who is is into that same thing that I'm into, the end of that thing that actually saved my life, I know I can go talk to them and there's going to be a commonality there. And so I think that punk has kind of a, a special, um, a, a, a special way of bringing people together under the, that, uh, under that set of um, uh, commonality that maybe certain things don't have. In 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 our community, uh, the the punk rock community was you know my I'm in, I'm a Ventura County community. And the the punk rock scene was the first one to say, "Hey, let's do something for Houston." They're the first ones to say, "Hey, let's do something for the Vegas shooting." Hey, let's do something yeah. for you know, and. Yeah. You, you go and you look at everyone there. They look like they haven't showered for weeks. You know what I mean? At the event. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm so inspired by by who, you know, by them and, and the community and how they love people. And yeah, it, it's yeah. just, I mean, they have great leaders. We have great leaders here. You know, Tony, Tony Cortez from Ill Repute, big leader in our community. Uh, right, right. And in a lot of other, you know, cornerstones there. And it's just right. awesome, and it's just somehow it just you know when we're talking, it just popped in my head that question. Yeah, no, I mean I, I feel you on that, and I think that's really cool. And I think that one of the really cool things that punk does, and it did it for us, like it taught us to be leaders without us even knowing that that's what was happening. You know, because uh, the the whole DIY ethic and and the idea that you know, like I heard other people say they're like well, hey, if we don't have it, let's just figure out how to do it, you know? And so immediately it teaches you to be a problem. Yeah, I mean, it <laughs> teaches you to be a problem solver, you know? <laughs> so, like, you know, and then one day you, you know, one day you're like, you know, you something happens and you look up and everybody's looking at you. Like, all right, what are we going to do? You know, and you're like, holy shit, I guess I'm the one that figures out what we're going to do, you know? And, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and and that's really cool because it 
you know, there's a, there's a teaching process in, in it with punk that people don't even realize. That's why I think you see, like, so many punk-started businesses, you know, like, because it's a, it's a cool thing where there's not any, there's never, like, a, like, I can't do it. There's always, like, all right, let's figure out how we do it. And, um, and, and so there's always, like, you know, in every city you go to, there's, like, some cool punk run thing, whether it's a restaurant, a bakery, a vegan restaurant, a, mm-hmm. a record store, you know, whatever, whatever things, you know, whatever passion somebody has in that lifestyle. And um, that's always, like, something that is really exciting. And, again, you know, it's like what you're saying. It's just, like, you know, when I, I know when I go to that fucking punk record store, I'm going to be stoked. Because yeah. like whoever's running it is going to be awesome, you know. So those are those are that's a really cool thing about about punk, and that's for sure what what attracted me to, to punk in, in so many ways. Well, Justin, man, it's been an awesome conversation, and uh, yeah, yeah. And I wish you nothing but success in this new album. I can tell you're really stoked about it. Uh, I can, yeah, I can see yeah. the, the light. In, in in your heart just you know shining and um and i i wish awesome. i wish you everything that your heart desires my man well right there with you man and yeah i love your your spirit and your energy and i love what you're doing and you know i think you're on the right path and you know i i love that kind of uh, like i said you know i i love um how you're thinking about other people it's really really inspiring you know and and uh, this is, you know, I guess this kind of comes back to, like, you know, you asking earlier about, like, how do you, do you have any hope, you know? And I'm like, fuck, yeah, see, I just had this conversation with you, and now I'm like, yeah, I have so much hope, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and, and that's what happens, you know? And we're in such a unique and lucky position in the band, because I get to talk to people like you all the time, you know? And it's like, that's why I stay optimistic and don't give up, you know? And it's... I realize like we're in like really unique and and uh, it's special. Like we're, we're lucky, you know, we're like in this really fortunate position. But yeah, it, it's it's wonderful to talk to you. I, I really appreciate it. I thank you. Um, well, be careful. Uh, and and you have are you guys going on tour? Yeah, we're going out in January. Actually, you're aren't you out of San Diego? Uh, I'm in Ventura, uh, California. Okay. Uh, so it's about. All oh, right. Okay. Because aren't you? You're there yeah. like the 27th or something, right? Right. Because we're in. I know we're in San Diego on the 30th. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and then I'm not sure. It, yeah. So which means we're going to be in California around that time. So January. But yeah, we're on tour in January and February. And so yeah, man. I mean, if you're out, please come say hi. That would yeah, be amazing. dude, for sure. I I definitely will. I because anytime we do an interview, I always try to like, uh, are they are they nearby so we can give them a copy of the magazine? You right, know what I mean? Right. And um, yeah, yeah. Well, you have my number, so just just shoot me a text a couple of days ahead. That would be great. All right, f- for sure, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely, that'd be totally sick. All right, man. Well, enjoy right, well, your hey, holidays. I'll let you go. Yeah, you too. You too. Take good care and be well. All right, man. You too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Damn.